Hi friends, thanks for showing up bright and early to think about spreadsheets. You guys are champs. <laughs> um, so I'm Emily Fagan and I have Humble Hands Harvest Farm in Decorah. My cousin Hannah and I started it two seasons ago. Um, and that was the first time I'd ever been in charge of a vegetable farm. And I realized, wow, I have no idea what price tag to put on things when I was at the farmer's market. Um, it didn't feel great to me to just copy the person two stands down. I like wanted to be sure that what I was doing was right. Um, so I decided to do a bunch of enterprise budgets and figure out the right numbers. Um, so probably you guys kind of know what that is, but an enterprise budget is a way to figure out what a crop costs, um, including labor and including all the overhead expenses that your farm holds. Um, yeah, it's a really useful thing for figuring out what to grow and how to do it. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna start the session by getting detailed and like walking you through an example of actually how to do one, and then Scott's gonna talk and I think get a little bit more big picture why it's useful, that kind of thing. So here we go. Um, I think it's good to get everything set up before the season starts and you're in the thick of it. Um, so first you gotta pick which crops you wanna do. Um, I decided, well, if I'm timing my labor on some things, I might as well time my labor on everything. And I did all of our crops, and it was really useful, but it drove me crazy. So I think you should probably choose a couple to do at a time until um, you get the hang of it. Um, and it involves a lot of record keeping, some of which you probably do already, some of which maybe you don't. So what I'm going to do first is show you the way I keep records um, and what they look like. Um, there are a gazillion ways to do it, but maybe one example will be useful. So here's the getting ready before the season starts, what kind of records you need to keep. Um, I'll, I'll show you our, the way we keep track of expenses. We just do it month by month. Every time Hannah or I buys anything, we go into the Google Drive and write it down. Um, and it's important for later in the season to figure out, uh, to, to have detailed like what you actually bought, not just how many dollars you spent, because it gets categorized in all sorts of different ways. Um, so keep, keep good track of things. Um, next, you need to know how much you plant of everything, how much space it uses up. So I just have a weekly calendar. Every time the planting's done for the week, I come into the spreadsheet and I write down how many bed feet of every crop got planted. Um, so once a week, you know, you have to do that. Same with the greenhouse. Every time we seed a flat, it gets written down week by week. Um, probably the most important sheet that I use is the harvest log. I have that with me in the wash station. Um, we harvest twice a week for farmer's markets. And every week, I scribble myself out a um, new little sheet that looks like this. And every time Hannah brings me a crop out of the field, I wash it, I weigh it or count it or whatever, write that in the amount harvested column, and then I detail how much of that crop goes to each outlet for the day. Um, it's really nice to be able to examine your markets separately rather than just having the lump sum because, uh, yeah, you charge different prices sometimes depending on where it goes. Um, and so if you've been doing that all season, then it'll be easy to know how much of the crop you're doing the enterprise budget for you produced. It's all right there. Um, you can wait till the end of the season to compile it, or you can do it as you go, um, whatever makes sense to you. But eventually you want to end up with a nice, concise list of all the, all the pints of cherry tomatoes you picked all year. Um, Next is the sales log. This is sort of comes from the harvest log, but um, it's nice to have separate logs for each of your markets. Um, so you can differentiate between the farmer's market and wholesale accounts and whatever other places you might have. Um, it's especially useful, I think, if you do go to farmer's markets to have this kind of sheet because the harvest log, maybe you kept track of how much, how many bunches of carrots you sent to the farmer's market, but you probably didn't sell them all. so. You have to like count what you brought back and, and know how many you actually sold. And it's, it's easy to keep track of it on a, on a sheet like this. OK, last one, keeping track of your labor. This is the part that you probably would never do unless you were doing an enterprise budget. And it's 
the biggest pain. <laughs> um, but it's the, it's the whole point of doing this, is to figure out how much time you spend, right, on a crop. Um, so it's important to, yeah, make it easier for yourself. The way I did it, I just had a notebook in the field with me. And every time I did something, I timed myself and wrote it down. Um, maybe you're higher tech than I am, and you have a smartphone and you can do it that way. But however you want to do it, keep track of it. And it's important to have it be detailed with what you're doing. Um, so you can know how much time you spent on the tractor, how much time you spent harvesting or uh, washing, because sometimes you can learn things um, once you know how much time you really spend doing each activity. Um, and to do the final calculations, you also have to know how much you pay per hour, which is easy if you have employees and you pay them by the hour, but if you start how I started, paying yourself a small amount of money every month and working a lot, then you get to confront how many dollars you make an hour, <laughs> and that's always really interesting. <laughs> so, yeah, those are all the records that you need. Um, it's February or whatever, you have them all ready, they're there, you know when you're gonna be using them. Um, and then, once there are a lot of weeds to hoe, you don't have to spend time thinking about it. You just fill in your blanks and do the work you normally do, and it's way easier. Um, then once there's snow on the ground, you can actually get down to business and like really crunch some numbers. Um, yeah, this is the good stuff. I, when I was figuring out how to divide up all the costs and, and really do this, I pretty much copied how Richard Wiswell did it in his book, um, the I think the Organic Vegetable Farmer's Business Handbook or something like that. He has spreadsheets, and I think there's a CD in the back with usable spreadsheets. Um, and the way he divided things up made sense to me, so I kind of copied it and tweaked it for how it made sense with my farm. But basically, there are all these categories of expense, and you can come to sort of a general number about them, like for the greenhouse, how much it costs to produce an empty flat full of soil. Um, and then from there, you can get crop specific for the crop that you're trying to learn about. Um, and that's really useful to do because once you have that general number, you can use it for any crop you want later down the road. Like the work has been done, and then you can just plug in the numbers afterwards. Um, so yeah, once you do it once, it's a lot easier. So now I'm gonna go through um, with all these categories on enterprise, enterprise budget I did for cherry tomatoes. Um, I, you also have a handout for me about salad mix. It's done in exactly the same way. I just thought it might be kind of nice to have two to look at just to see the differences. Um, but I'll show you cherry tomatoes on the screen right now. So how much does it cost to deliver them all the places they need to go? Um, our, we have a lot of different places we take food. We take it to the farmer's market. We have a CSA. We do some wholesale. Um, so you need to figure out that cost for every different journey the cherry tomatoes take. But I'll just show you the farmer's market one because it has a lot of important things in it. Um, so this first, this first little piece here is how to figure out how much it takes, how much money it costs to get a full truck of vegetables to the farmer's market. That's your general number that's not specific to any kind of crop. So the first part is labor. Um, all these numbers are in dollars, but... I'll t probably talk about hours a lot. Um, so for labor, you know, that's time spent loading the truck, driving the truck, setting up the market, being at the market, tearing down the market, all the time related to the market gets accounted for there. Um, then how, much, how many miles away is the market? How far do you drive? How much gas do you use? You have to take that into account also. Um, and we all pay market fees per season, so divide that out by how many markets you think you're gonna be at and figure out the cost per market for that fee. Um, and then we all have a lot of stuff, right? We have tables and signs and baskets and more signs and who knows what, and all of those things cost money. Um, so yeah, but most of them are gonna last longer than a year, right? Like hopefully you buy your tables and they're gonna last you for 10 years or something. So when you're trying to come to a number to put in that table, you need the cost per year per like per farmer's market per year. So there's a lot of dividing involved. Um, so you just have to take all of your materials, guess how long they'll last you, and divide it up like that. But then you add it all up and you get your cost for a full truck to the farmer's market. And then 
you have to figure out how much of that the cherry tomatoes are going to account for. Does it make sense for them to pay the way for all the other vegetables in the truck, right? So, but if you kept a harvest log, you can know how many crops went to market that day um, and divide it out that way. So say you had 50 crates or whatever and two of them are cherry tomatoes, then you know that two fiftieths of that of this cost here get designated to cherry tomatoes. Um, so I'm sort of an obsessive person and I like had the list of all the farmers markets for the whole year and I went and made that fraction for each one of the markets and that was a little crazy. That's what's right here. You could make it easier on yourselves and guess a little bit and say, well, my truck is usually this full. I usually have this many cherry tomatoes. I think they went 10 times. I'll just call it good with that guess. Um, so you can be as detailed or not as you want, but that's the general idea. You want to find out the fraction of the total load that the cherry tomatoes use. Yeah? Uh, the question is about the vehicle we take to the farmer's market, and we have a big white box van type thing. It looks like a bread truck, but we put a cooler in the back. So, yeah, so that's the delivery cost. You do that for all of your outlets and add it up, and you're one step closer. Uh, next, we grow cherry tomatoes from transplants, so there's some cost incurred when we're using our greenhouse. Um, the year I did this, we were renting space from Glenn as we were building our own, so I, I did it twice, and the cherry tomatoes were in Glenn's greenhouse, which is sort of too bad because it's way pricier, but um, yeah, you need to think about how much soil goes into an empty flat, how much time you spend moving it around and watering it. Um, how much the flat itself cost. Think of all those numbers, tally them up. And then, um, then you can make it crop specific because you kept track of all your expenses. You know how much you spent on tomato seeds, so you can add that in. And a special tomato thing is we start them in just blank flats and once they germinate then we pot them up into bigger pots. So that is some extra time that only cherry tomatoes get. So we add that in here too. And then we know how much it costs for a flat of cherry tomato transplants. Um, and we also know how many of those we had from our greenhouse planting logs. So you can multiply that out. And there you are. Those are your greenhouse costs. Next is figuring out your machinery. Um, for our firm, that was pretty simple. We have one little tractor with a tiller and a mower and a bucket, and that's all. So. Um, you know, if you have cultivating tractors and a bunch of different tractors you use for different things, you'll have to do this for each tractor. But um, basically, you're trying to figure out how much it costs you per hour to operate. Um, and to do that, you figure out, I mean, you know how much you paid for it in the beginning, and you can guess at how long its lifetime is. Divide that out to get the cost of the tractor per year. And then from all your expenses, you'll know how much you spent on getting the oil changed and any repairs you had to do and any fuel you bought for it. Um, add that to the tally, get a total annual cost, and then you can guess at how many hours you used it um, per, per season. You can like totally keep track or you can just kind of guess. Um, but then you divide that and you get the cost per hour. Um, Next, to figure out how many hours the cherry tomatoes used, that's when your detailed labor accounting comes in handy because you'll have noted on there how much time you spent tilling or spreading compost or mowing or whatever you do with your tractor. Um, so you can add, just add up that tally and yeah, multiply by the cost per hour. So for cherry tomatoes, ours is pretty small. We, we don't have a cultivating tractor, so we just till for 30 seconds and it's done. Um, but that's the cost of our tractor. Okay, this is the last section and probably the most intensive. Um, every farm has a lot of infrastructure that costs a lot of money and you have to figure out how to account for it. Um, so yeah, figure out, you know, you have greenhouses, you have a cooler, you have a bunch of different sheds, you have a deer fence, all those things. Um, this is our list for our first year. It would be bigger now if I did it again, but um, yeah, figure out how much it costs you. I assumed that all of these things would last for 20 years. 
Um, I really hope our deer fence lasts for longer than that, but I just have to pick a number kind of to be able to figure out the cost per year. Um, I think it's okay to fudge a little bit and guess. But yeah, tally all your infrastructure costs annually, <coughs> add them up, and then you're left with all the overhead stuff. This is the place where I put every expense that didn't already have a place. Um, there are obvious things like rent and like office supplies and utilities and all that kind of stuff, but like, you know, whatever random tools, just put it in the supply category, put it up there, um, figure out how much it costs per year, and yeah, th this is sort of the catch-all for all the other random expenses that don't really have a place. But the really hard part is to figure out how to um, divide that cost between all your crops. It's not very clear, right? Like, who uses the deer fence more? Like, who knows, you know? Um, but you have, to, you have to do it somehow. Um, and the way Richard Wiswald did it in his book made a lot of sense to me, so I did that too. Um, he decided to do it by area, because every crop takes up space. No matter how you grow it or what it is, it, it holds space somewhere. So um, for our farm, the places that use space are, where, where plants use space is our field and the greenhouse where we start our transplants. Um, some crops use both, some crops just go in the field. But um, yeah, and so we have two acres, it's not that much, so we sort of plant things in like a certain number of beds per crop or half a bed or something. So I thought it would make, make sense for us to figure out the overhead cost per bed um, and go from there. So, okay. This, you gotta bear with me, I wrote these formulas, I hope it's not too early for that. But, um, so you start with your total cost. This is the sum of the infrastructure and overhead, right? This number right here. This is what you're trying to allocate um, to the field and to the greenhouse. So, this word total here references this number. Um, so you're trying to figure out what fraction of that total gets devoted to the field as a whole. So. Um, you add you add the area, I added the area of our field and the area of our greenhouse in square feet for the total area and divided just the field area by that. That gets you a fraction of this total cost. Um, and that is the, the fraction of the overhead and infrastructure costs that the field holds. And then divide that by the number of beds that you have planted. And that gets you your cost per bed. Um, and similarly for the greenhouse, you know how many crops went in there? Um, and so rather than using the field area here, you would use the greenhouse area and you would divide by the number of crops in the greenhouse to figure out how much of this overhead uh, plants grown from transplants take up. Um, I hope that made some kind of sense. You can ask me questions about it at the end, I think. Um, but yeah, so that's how you figure out how much of the, these general overhead costs each bed in your field needs to absorb, which is a really interesting number, right? Because for us, we know that like at the very least, we have to be making over $200 out of one bed of our field to make this any kind of worth it. Um, so it's a great number to know. Okay, that's all the hard work. Now you all, all you have to do is add it all up. So. Delivery, greenhouse, machinery, infrastructure. And here you get to tally all your labor hours and multiply by however much you make per hour. Add that in. And then you have a total cost per season for the crop. And you can go back to your harvest records and know how much of it you produced, divide it out, and get cost per unit. So this means that it costs our farm $1.14 to get a pint of cherry tomatoes wherever it needs to go. And that was great news for us because we charge $4 for them at the farmer's market, so we know we're making money and we know we should keep growing a lot of them. Whew. Yeah, so there's a lot of work to get one little number, but there's a lot of goodness in that number. You can learn a lot of interesting things. Um, so I'll just run through a few examples of how I use these numbers. Um, it can help you decide which markets to sell it through. So a great example for us here is potatoes. I learned that it costs us two something a pound to produce potatoes. 
um, we were wholesaling them for a dollar something, and we were selling them at the farmer's market for three or four bucks a pound and while I was doing these budgets. And once I figured that out, I was like, okay, we're going to quit wholesaling potatoes, which, number one, helps us be totally profitable in potatoes, and number two, saves us a lot of work because we don't have to grow so many to like fill wholesale accounts. Um, so it was great, great knowledge for that. Um, it can also help you decide to quit growing something. Like, you realize nobody cares enough about turnips to pay the right amount per pound for it to be worth your while, so you can just stop <laughs> and save yourself a lot of energy. Um, and it can also help you decide, like, how, or it can help you think about ways to grow a crop better so that you can charge the right amount for it. Um, for us, the first year we were farming, when I was doing these, we didn't have a setup for irrigation yet in the field, and it was a pretty dry year. So all of our brassicas really, really suffered. Um, they were thirsty, and our soil isn't that great either. So they were having a really hard time, and I couldn't sell it. The cabbages were too small for me to sell them for enough for it to be worth it. But the next year, this past year, it rained a ton. I fertilized them. Um, they were so happy, and cabbages were profitable. So. There's a lot of play in like how you do it, what the weather is. It can it can change the mix around a lot. Um, yeah, and right, these numbers are really useful, but you don't have to totally like change your whole farm because of them if you don't want to. Like, I love to grow dry beans. It's totally absurd and inefficient and whatever, but it makes me really happy and. Then, it's like getting paid to do my hobby, <laughs> shelling dry beans. So I can know how much I should be earning for them. I know that I'm not, but I can I can also look and say, okay, we're growing enough like we're growing enough profitable crops like cherry tomatoes and carrots and peppers that they can they can kind of make that habit of mine okay. And um, I know my farm is still coming out on top, even though I decide to grow dry beans. So you can. You can use the results as much or as little as you want, but I think it's really useful to know what you're getting yourself into. Um, yeah, I hope that example made some kind of sense. I, right, I gave you guys the salad mix uh, sheet too, if you found that at the door. All those numbers were found in exactly the same way. Um, and Scott also printed out his uh, enterprise budget for the same crop on a at a very different farm at a very different scale. So have fun comparing those. Um, but I'll let him get up here and do his part. Really, the gist of my presentation is to think about scale. Um, you know, you can see um, when I started, mine was very much similar to Emily's, and that I, when we started with our quarter acre back in 2010, and our first high tunnel, it was you know, keeping the, the pencil and paper in my pocket and writing down how many minutes I spent stringing tomatoes and, and how many, you know, hours I spent delivering and, and really coming down with that. But as we expanded and as I started to need to go to a bank to get capital, um, because at some point, you know, as we grew from that quarter acre to one to two, and I think it was about when we made that jump from four to 15 acres when I graduated from Iowa State, I needed to start going and getting a line of credit um, to make it work. Um, yeah, I get, there's real quick a scale of how I expanded. And so 2011, a quarter acre to an acre to two to five, the year I graduated Iowa State, to 15 to, um, we're at about 60 acres that we use for vegetable production now, but we always keep about 10 of it out um, for either organic row crops or, um, or just fallow ground, um, usually on the organic ground. But, you know, a lot of what Emily said, how are we doing it? Crop planning, labor planning, crop budgets, marketing infrastructure, and then post-season, going back and looking at everything we did right and wrong. Usually the wrong is what we learn from. The right, you know, you can just do that again for the most part. Um, but, you know, you have to think about the scale of your operation. Like I said, I'm going to rush through this so we can have time for questions and answers and whatnot. But, you know, when we started, um, a budget like Emily's was more in line with what made sense. But as we've expanded, a budget like what we have, and I built this probably the year I graduated Iowa State when we went to 15 acres, where I really sat down and I started breaking down every single thing that you know goes into that crop. Um, but also being cognizant that that changes you know during the season. And so just coming up with averages. Um, I got tired of keeping that pen and paper in my pocket. 
Um, and so we just started saying it's going to take this long to weed an acre or a bed of, of crop. Um, but what's my scale? Um, you know, are you hand driven, push tractor driven? When we started harvesting lettuce, which is a big part of our business, we were using scissors and it took forever to fill, you know, a, a harvest bin like what you see in that lower corner. Now we have one of these push lettuce harvesters and we can do about 300 pounds an hour with that. And so, you know, for, for scale comparison, I don't know how many pounds you'll harvest at any given time, but we'll do 200 pounds a day easy if we aren't filling our contracts. And if we're doing contracts, we're doing 2000 pounds when we harvest. And so we're, we're moving through quite a bit of lettuce as we roll. But, you know, the scale matters and what's your weekly output. And this is something that took me a while to really start thinking about. Um, and this has been a slow transition for me um, as our farms expanded. So originally when I started growing, we were uh, doing just the one farmer's market and no wholesale, no retail, anything like that. We were thinking about things by the bunch. You know, how many bunches do we need to take to market? How many bunches do we need to harvest? You know. How much does it cost to make that bunch? And then we started doing restaurants and grocery stores, and we started thinking by the case. And then we started doing some wholesale, and we started thinking by the pallet. And now we're in that awkward transition between pallet and filling an entire truck with product. Um, and that can be, uh, I mean, that's a huge jump to go from, you know, 50 cases of kale, which is, you know, over 1,000 bunches, to, you know, eight pallets of that, so 8,000 bunches at a time. I mean, that's a lot of product. Um, to move on a truck at any given time. And so that's kind of our awkward stage right now is pallet to box truck um, on stuff. Um, but, you know, who are your current customers? When you think about that, um, you know, coming up with your, your final price, um, if you guys will, you know, if you guys can see on mine, when I, at the very top, you can see my income columns. I try to be really conservative on income and really liberal on expenses on my budgets because I'd rather show a lower profit margin on my enterprise budget. So when I go to the banker at the end of the year, I can go, look, I made money instead of having a bad year and, and always not, or you know, even having a good year and always going to the bank and saying, I didn't meet my, my goals and expectations. But um, you know, for us, you know, if I'm looking at Emily's, you're, uh, you're figuring your cost per pound six thirty and a price per pound of nine dollars. Um, we could not sell a single pound of lettuce if we were at nine dollars in our area. It just doesn't work. Um, a lot of times when we're dealing with the wholesale companies we deal with, I mean, we're figuring out things by by the nickel on what makes sense pound wise. And so, you know, we like to think that you know at least at a minimum wholesale we'll get four dollars a pound. Um, and then when we do our retail, our clamshells that we're selling to grocery stores, we're more at that six, seven dollars a pound, sometimes eight, depending on the market. But I, like I said, I try to be really conservative on my income, just so that I don't overthink it on the expenses and 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 you know think that I can be very extravagant on anything. But moving beyond that, what, like I said, who are my current customers? Um, you know, are you doing farmers markets, CSA, farm stands? Because that's where you're going to make your most dollars per unit. Um, you know, as you move into restaurants and then uh, grocers, um, that's where you're going to make your second amount of, you know, your second most amount of income. But, you know, the grocers can depend on whether or not you're doing a co-op grocery store that um, pays more of a fair price or if you're trying to move volume to um, a grocery chain like uh, Price Chopper Hen House like we have in Kansas City or Hy-Vee like you guys have more of up here. As you get into doing wholesalers, um, you know, with local food, you're going to get more than that standard commodity price, but, you know, it's only going to be about 10 to 20 percent more, you know, and you eventually get to a point where you're competing with California uh, minus the shipping. And, and that's kind of where we're at now as we ship to Colorado for Whole Foods. Um, and then food processors and institutional. And a lot of those, a lot of the food processors and institutional end up uh, going to school districts. Um, we have a processor in Missouri we ship to, and that's where we bring back a lot of revenue. Um, you know, it doesn't show it on this one because this is leaf lettuce and it's either good or bad um, out of the field. But like on our tomatoes, we have a breakdown of number one and number two. And those number twos, you know, we might only get 30 cents a pound, which is under our cost of production, but we're pulling out that revenue off a crop that we've already picked, sorted, washed, and packaged. Um, and so we're able to ship that to a processor and gain back some of that revenue instead of just throwing them away or, or you know, composting. Uh, you know, what do your customers want? You know, they want, this is something that, um, as I mentioned earlier, we do both organic and conventional. And so this was a big deal for us to think about was what do our customers want? As we started to scale up to the size where we needed to start moving, you know, half pallets and pallets, we realized that the produce companies in Kansas City we worked with 
we're willing to pay a little bit of a premium for organic or a little bit of a premium for local, but not both. Um, the market in Kansas City, um, you know, it's been years since I've lived in Iowa, and so I'm not really sure what it's like here. But around Kansas City, it's a meat and potatoes country, and paying $4 or $5 a bunch for organic kale just doesn't work. Um, and so um, we had certain crops that we were trying to grow organically, but we just couldn't justify growing and selling a watermelon for, for $7 a melon wholesale. And so we started growing those conventionally just to reduce our costs and, and labor input. Um, and then what scale do you want to be? Um, you know, for me, going to Iowa State and learning about enterprise budgets from that acre scale and the row crop side, I was an ag business major. Um, that's the scale I wanted to see. As I drive down my roads, you know, to my farm every day, I drive by corn and beans, and I'd like to think someday it'll be thousands of acres of sweet corn and green beans. You know, that's kind of how I think about my valley um, and how I'd like to produce food in the long run is, is food for my whole region, um, not just, uh, you know, that, that farmer's market in town. Um, so, you know, we're really about um, scaling up to that wholesale, um, you know, I'd like to be at the truckload, you know, the semi-load um, down the road with watermelon, pumpkins, all of that. And we've actually shipped our first semi-load this year, which was fun. Um, but, you know, and then do I need to grow my customer base to grow my operation? And that's something we um, have done some, but have also decided, you know, like our restaurants, we, oh, chefs are a pain in the butt. And so... We, um, yeah, if any of you guys sell to chefs, you'll know that. It's, it's not easy. And so we've decided to focus more on that wholesale and not really increase how many restaurants we sell to because it's not really worth our time to do that um, for a $50 or $100 sale. It's, I'd rather ship the $8,000 to one warehouse than do, you know, $80, $100 runs to, to get the same outcome. Um, so, you know, and then, uh, you know, some of these questions are harder to, to answer than you might think um, in terms of thinking about the long-term sustainability and economic sustainability of your farm. Um, you know, I'm young, I'm first generation, I make all of my income off of the farm, and to do that, I need to be profitable. Um, I am not a big fan of thinking about going and getting another job. Um, somebody asked me a question yesterday um, when I was giving a talk, and the only payroll checks I've had other than the farm we're working in seventh and eighth grade at a sweet corn farm and being a tutor at Iowa State. And so like that's the only two jobs I've really had. I haven't had a real job because um, this isn't a real job. It's fun most of the time. But, you know, um, so, so, you know, thinking about that, um, you know, you really do have to think about what point um, you can build a farm to make it sustainable for yourself. Um, and then the scale of, um, you know, what scale is profitable. Um, for us, it's going larger scale. Um, we're fortunate that because we do so many acres of hay and alfalfa and row crops, we have larger equipment and larger tractors. And so our cost, you know, to uh, prep a, an acre of ground for the vegetables is relatively low. But you also see in here that under my, um, in my budget to prep, a, you know, an acre of lettuce, I say that we'll take two disc pass at $50. It costs us about $12.50 to run over an acre with our disc. So that's where I'm really liberal with expense. I'd rather say that I have to wake up, drive to the farm, hook up the disc, check all the oil, you know, drive down, disc, you know, because usually when I disc, I'm going over all 12 acres, you know, of that organic field at once or, you know, that chunk. But I'd rather think about me having to do the entire thing and just be really liberal with my um, expenses so, so I don't go over budget in that sense. But, you know, answering these questions comes down to record keeping, just like Emily. Um, when I first started, and these are really hard to see, and I'm happy to show anybody of these like up front, but this is our first graph of keeping track of all of our heirloom tomatoes, number one and number two harvest for every single variety, every single time we harvested. My employees hated me for that, just utterly hated me um, for making them do that. But what happened after we got our you know, total plants and everything is we were able to come up with these graphs. And so we were able to figure out exactly how many pounds of which we harvested, and this was just our very, this was from, I think, 13. So this was our, really our first big to, you know, like heirloom tomato year in our high tunnel. But figuring out, you know, our percentage of number ones and number twos, coming up with total yield per plant, figuring out our revenue, our average revenue per number one and number two, and then coming up with our economic yield per plant. And that's where, the, right there is what mattered. Um, and so I believe our cost of production that year was about $18 a plant. Um, if I remember right off that enterprise budget. And so you can see the Martha Washingtons worked, the Cherokee Purples didn't, 
Japanese Blacks works. Um, you know, our big money maker was the Defiant, uh, just a red slicer tomato. Um, and so this was a really interesting way. Um, you know, my employees started to appreciate what they did all summer when they got to see this and they got to see, you know, that we figured out per plant what we were making money on. And some of it, when you're out in the field, you're going to be able to figure out just by harvest. Um, I mean, the German Johnsons, I love German Johnsons, and, and they made money, but uh, the Brandywines, a tomato I love, or the Striped Germans is what I meant. The Striped Germans, I loved Striped Germans. They're a great BLT tomato, but we were making, what, $13 a plant. So we didn't grow those again because we were losing money um, putting time and, and effort into them. Um, you know, these are some of the, the things we track very similar to yours in the sense of this is what we're using in the field, our crop tracker, our harvest log. Um, I wanted to put this up here so you guys had some record keeping resources to look at. Um, Ag squared is what we started with. It's about maybe $50 a year, if I'm remembering right. When we were at that, you know, up to four acre scale, this worked fantastic for us because we were able to put in our seeds, our cost, where we wanted to plan everything and set up a true schedule for everything. And it was fantastic. As we got bigger, that got harder. And so we switched to just really using Excel on our own in-house spreadsheets. And, and it was just simply because um, I had a lot of time as I sat, sat in class in statistics that I didn't pay attention to statistics. And so I did a lot of Excel spreadsheets. Um, we've since switched as we've gotten bigger um, to COG Pro. Um, it's about $150 a year, if I'm not mistaken, and it is fantastic for organic record keeping. So organic record keeping for us, because we do both organic and conventional, is absolutely essential. Um, our certifier makes sure that we um, have every single wash log of that sprayer or of that disc or of that tractor or um, even, you know, the harvest, uh, you know, our sinks and stuff we have to do organic clean downs on. So we have a lot of SOPs on the farm and all of that has to go into COG Pro. And I'll say that I don't know what scale everybody's at and whether or not anybody's here is on the border of GAP certified versus not. Um, but COG Pro has a record keeping app for GAP certification now too. And so you can keep all your GAP records and training and everything. And, and that's something we're gonna be uh, having to comply with later this year. Um, you know, I give all of my employees a, a journal that they can write in at the end of the day. Um, some of them just write their hours and then they write their hours on their time card and they go home and that's their prerogative. But I, I prefer it when they kind of write up a little bit of what they did. So at least I can, if I have time at the end of the year, just kind of talk about, you know, or see what, what, uh, what they kind of dedicated their time on. You know, did those cherry tomatoes take longer because they, we missed a week worth of stringing and so it took three times as long to, you know, do that row of stringing versus, versus, uh, versus that hour. Um, and then, um, you know, if you guys want, a, you know, you can ask me about other things. I use a lot, QuickBooks is what we use for all the accounting, which at the end of the day, um, tracking the sales, like what you're doing, it makes it very easy because we have item codes for every single thing we do. So we can do a search query and, and just pull it up. And, and I know exactly how many we sold and what the average price was. And so then I can take that average price, look at my sheet and know, you know, fairly easily with minimal effort did we meet our margins that we were hoping for. Um, the budgeting, none of us want to do it. Um, I'm a nerd, so I like to do it. I really like the spreadsheets and sitting down and doing this. Um, but, you know, without it, um, you're going to go to market or you're going to go sell to that restaurant. That restaurant's going to say, I can give you a dollar a bunch, and you're going to say, I got a bunch of it, I need to sell it. And, and you're going to realize you aren't making any money um, in the long run. I think a lot, of, a lot of people that farm, or at least a lot of people in my area, the beginning of the year, if they have, you know, 10,000 in the bank, and at the end of the year, if they have 15, they think they made money. And that's not true. Um, that's just plain not true um, how that works. And so, you know, without that stuff, um, you know, you really aren't going to know if you're a profitable operation or not. I always show this slide when I talk about budgets to tell you this is not how to be a you know, economically viable farm. This was the first year I was allowed to plant the high tunnel by myself without my mentor. Um, and I went a little crazy. Uh, there was like edible flowers, okra, there was radishes, uh, broccoli. I, I put sweet corn in, or uh, uh, dry field corn. Um, I made some uh, horrible mistakes all over the place. But, um, you know, that's just to show, that's kind of where I started. I didn't know what the hell I was doing. Um, and so, you know, as I started to learn about enterprise budgets at, at college and then started to transfer them from kind of the row crop side to, um, 
the vegetable side, it really made me start appreciating and, and working towards, um, you know, being profitable. And I believe this is my cherry tomato budget. And so what was my, what was your cost per pint? Dollar fourteen. So I figured I was at a dollar twenty nine when I did this, and I believe we were using plastic pints for this budget, and so we were almost spot on, um, which is really interesting to think that we were that close um, on that whole deal. Um, but you can see how mine I broke down more in terms of, and you know, a lot of things: greenhouse lease, flat strip line, irrigation. You know, a lot of the things Emily mentioned in hers, um, right there on mine. Um, so two different farms, two different states. Um, I don't remember which year this is from, but you know, two different scales in that sense. I think this was a, this would have been 180 cherry tomato plants, um, but very similar. And you'll notice, like right here, twenty dollars an hour is what I budget for labor. All of my field crew starts at 1050 and quickly gets bumped up to 1150 if they stay for a month. You know, we have people ranging from that 1050 to to 2250 an hour that work for me, and so. You know, that was just to say, okay, let's just imagine in the budget, once again, being very liberal with expenses that everybody's making $20 an hour after payroll tax and workers' comp and insurance and all of that. Um, but this is another thing I wanted uh, you guys to write down. Um, I also got a lot out of that Organic Farmers Business Handbook. Um, I have that CD actually sitting on my desk right now um, that I need to upload into my new computer. But... Um, Iowa State, this is where I really started and got my ideas for building out my own enterprise budgets because um, I, you know, these spreadsheets that you guys have in front of you, this is more of a custom, uh, you know, sit down and figure it out. But, you know, uh, the Ag Decision Maker breaks it down to the bed. Um, so it's really easy to, to, you know, start crafting something that makes sense for you and then you can transfer it over to your own file and start building off of that. Um, wholesale success was a really helpful thing. Um, Excel, it, they're fairly easy to make. And then K-State, because um, I'm a Kansas guy, so I have to, you know, throw Kansas out a little bit. Also has some good enterprise budgets. So, um, yeah, I think that's that's a, just about it for me. And so I think, I don't know if you want to come up and talk about your lettuce at all. I mean, maybe talk about how you harvest and all of that. Um, and I can kind of talk about mine. So I'm going to just fold that whole acre one aside because that's how I think. But the bed is how we think about in our high tunnels and how we really think about what we do. Um, you know, so we figure, gosh, and this is hard to read. Um, we figure we can get about 78 pounds of bed, um, so about 0.78 pounds per row foot. And our beds are three foot or um, 28 inches wide. So uh, per bed foot, you know, we can get about 0.78 pounds, so we can get, can get about $340 a bed. So then I break it down into my seed. What's my seed cost? And we actually, so we grow leaf lettuce, greens, spring mix, arugula, baby kale, spinach. So we have, you know, six different, you know, crops that we grow kind of within this enterprise. Each one of them has their own enterprise that accounts for the seed. And it's really easy for us to, to change that because I have another Excel spreadsheet that is literally my seed costs per pound break it down to ounce and we figure out how much we plant. And a lot of that we figured out, I haven't tracked how many ounces we're planting in forever, but three years ago we spent you know, an entire spring season weighing our seed before we planted and weighing our seed after. So we kind of got that average and just said, okay, we've spent time on figuring out that average. There's no need to spend more time on it. Here we go. Um, you know, figuring out drip line, um, lay flat, um, all the field prep, um, you know, obviously we aren't taking a disc through the high tunnel, but, you know, we are, we are taking a tiller or something through. And so figuring up all of that cost, um, as shocking as it is to say, we still use an earthway seeder to seed almost all of our lettuce and greens, even on an acreage scale. Um, my employees get a workout. Uh, they, one of them walked, I think he said, 60-something miles last year planting lettuce. Um, and it's because, in, in a sense, we know it works. We're really happy with it, and the cedar we want is about $15,000, um, you know, to, to really take that next step into efficiency. Um, the nice thing about the Earthway, though, is when he's done with a bed, or when she, you know, Monica's done with a bed, they can just dump it out, dump the new one in, and they're on to the next one. There's no shutdown startup of that planter. Um, you know, we aren't at the scale where we're planting 10 beds of lettuce. We're planting one or two at a time every week, and so it just doesn't, we're at that awkward stage where if I had cash, I'd get a nice planter, but we're, we're going to keep using the earthways. Um, 
But, you know, going on from there, um, you know, cultivation, um, hand harvest is really machine harvest for us. But figuring out that with that machine, um, we went from doing about, I don't know, 20, well, no, about like 10 pounds an hour, one person to two people can do 380 pounds an hour with that harvester. And so our cost per unit for harvest, or for harvest has just, you know, just bottomed out. It's been fantastic. Um, but, you know, and then, um, so, you know, between that, um, between the variable expenses, so the inputs, labor, machinery, and then harvest, those are all my variables. And so if I choose to plant the vegetable or not, you know, those expenses will either be there or not. Whereas my fixed, my, my land, my interest on my operating note, and just random miscellaneous expenses, those are always going to be there because I've sunk that cost into renting that land before I've started the season. So, you know, then coming up with your income, your variable expense, fixed expense, and then I usually like to break it down so I can see how many, um, you know, dollars per pound I have in my inputs, my machinery. You guys can see harvest for us um, on the bottom is $1.92 um, per pound um, on that. And so, you know, that's, that's a huge chunk. And so, you know, for us, if we don't have to harvest it, we won't. Um, you know, I'd rather not harvest more than we need when we're shipping. Um, because that just means extra time and money goes into that 100 pounds. You know, maybe if we harvest an extra 20 pounds, that's $80 of, you know, cost that went into that green and harvest uh, that uh, we just wasted. Um, so you guys can see where I come out with about three forty-five dollars um, a pound. Our average is five twenty, and then we have our gross margin at about 33.5%. And so does that make sense? I talk really fast. Um, you want to maybe we'll talk about yours? Because I know yeah. you were saying that you guys use knives to hand harvest and, and all of that, which is where we were. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so ours is a much smaller scale. We probably plant like 20 feet of salad mix every week. Um, and we don't have a, we cultivate with hoes. Um, so we plant three rows in a probably little under four foot bed so we can have space in between the rows to get our hose through. Um, and... Yeah, we plant so little at a time, I don't even use a cedar. I just, like, make the furrows, throw it in there, cover them up. It takes, like, a minute to do 20 feet. Um, so that's probably the biggest difference between our, our two enterprise enterprises. And we harvest with knives. We just go down the row and throw it in a crate. Um, yeah, I won't run through the whole thing because I did it exactly the same way I did the cherry tomatoes. But, um, yeah. Probably most of the cost, I mean, one, one interesting thing I learned from doing all of these budgets is that for every single crop, the biggest amount of cost came from all of our overhead stuff. Like, it, because our farm was a hay field to begin with, we had to put in a well, we had to put in electricity, we had to build the deer fence, we had to, like, spend a lot of money beginning. Um, so... In the end, it doesn't matter very much how much faster or efficient we are at harvesting. We just have to harvest it and sell it so we can like cover that cost. Um, yeah. <laughs> I think at that point, we're hitting time. So questions, guys? Uh -huh. uh, are you eating cones to eat? Um, so uh, on our planted uh, lettuce and stuff, we're doing a density, you know, a high density planting. So we aren't using pelleted seed. We're just using like the small plates that you know, Earthway has, and we're just rolling it out. Um, and that's really, we've gone back and forth. We've tried pelleted seed, and we just don't get a thick enough germination and set to really make sense with that push harvester. So that push harvester takes a lot of, you need a lot of product in front of you um, to be able to push. And if anybody wants to come up afterwards, I'll show them a video of what that thing does on my phone. It's, it's pretty sweet. But, I mean, you have to have a very dense planting. So we're planting every two inches to three inches in that bed. And it's eight, um, eight rows, essentially. Yeah, so it's every three inches, um, eight beds, or eight rows. We've got eight cedars. Hmm? We've got eight cedars? No, it's There's one. So yeah, so it's like, yeah. Yeah, we have, a, we, have an, uh, we have some Amish guys building us a, a super earthway this winter. Nice. <laughs> they do it. <laughs> yeah, right? Mm -hmm. um, are you, uh, with that earthway, are you using the, just the, the lettuce plate? Yeah, so it depends. On, oh, um, lettuce plate. Are we using the lettuce plate with the Earthway? Um, just one pass. So, yes. 
Um, but it depends on what we're planting. If we're doing the lettuce, um, we're using the lettuce plate. If we're doing the spinach, we're using the beet plate. Yeah. Um, if we're doing uh, the kale and arugula and, and the mixed greens blend, um, I believe we're using, um, I think we're using the radish plate yeah. for that too, yeah. um, so that we can get more dumped out. Um, we found that the light plate that they sell for Seedway was just not thick enough. Um, but yeah, we, we, uh, we've bought every single plate that Earthway has ever made and then we've, we've crafted, so they sell blank plates yeah, too that we've messed around with. Uh huh. Have you had experience with the, the, the Yang here? I have, I have not been very happy with it. Um, that's not to say that it couldn't be something that would work. Um, we've played around with a two row one that some neighbors bought that never used. And so we have a two row that's set on 40 inch rows that we've done Swiss chard and stuff with, but and I've planted head lettuce with it before, and frankly, I've just not been very happy with it. So I've been looking at something called the spider cedar. It's out of California, it's, but you know, you're, like I said, looking at like $15,000 for something that could plant lettuce. And so it's, it's not cheap, but you know, if I'm gonna make that step, I wanna do it right, and I don't wanna get something that I'm gonna kinda be on the, you know, I'm kinda on the fence about to begin with. <laughs> I've only used Earthways. I don't have a lot of it cedar experience, to be honest. Yeah. For about a hundred bucks, Earthway is the cheapest, greatest cedar you're gonna get. Yeah, they're light. They're easy to use. You can pick them up and dump them out. So how does negotiation go? You want to start? Yeah. Um, there isn't a ton of negotiation for us. We just put our sign up in the market, and that's how it is. Um, we do, sometimes I do look around at what other vendors are doing, and I try not to, I mean, I definitely try not to undercut any of them because that's no fun. Um, at least that's how I did it the first year. The second year, this past year, I knew what I needed to charge, and so I just did that, and if it was more expensive than other people's, oh well. Um, but we've stopped, we sort of stopped doing a lot of wholesale accounts too, and there was probably more negotiation there um, we were always sort of trying to push for more and push for more and um, yeah, sometimes you can do that. Sometimes you have to just take, take the price. But after doing all these budgets, I decided I just wanted to set my own and call it that. <laughs> so I think about it a little differently on my end in terms of uh, negotiating because I know that some places I'm going to be able to get, I, and I'm going to use conventional winter squash as an example just because you know, for me, I just was able to punch in a number real quick and kind of figure out our average price that we're making. So if I'm selling one box to a restaurant, I'm gonna charge them 24 bucks, which is what we sell wholesale organic for. But if you're buying three or four or five, you're gonna get it more for like 18 or something. And, and if you're buying a pallet, you know, if we're taking it to, to Liberty Fruit in Kansas City or, or US Foods, we're getting $12 a case. I mean, that's just what the commodity market price for conventional winter squash is, like spaghettis or acorns. And so, you know, that $12 a case is like 34 cents a pound. Um, but, you know, I believe our average price over the whole year, and once again, I can look this up in QuickBooks like that, our average price was about 17.90 or something a pound. And so that's roughly 50 cents a pound. Well, our cost of production was about 27 cents. And so we're, you know, almost double our money on that squash um, when we're shipping it like that. And so, you know, some markets like the, uh, like the wholesale where we're making 33 cents a pound, you know, I'm only making five, six, seven, eight cents a pound. Um, you know, so what is that per case? You know, it, it ends up being about $2 a case, I believe, is what our profit is. But, you know, when we're taking it to that restaurant, we still only have that 27 cents a pound in, but we're getting, you know, damn near 75 cents a pound. Um, and so for us, it's really about finding the markets and then coming up with that average year end price. Um, and so when I approach a Whole Foods, we, we go, oh, we'd like to be at $20 a case, but if you buy 10 cases or more, because I need to get my truck full every time I ship it, because if that truck's not full, everything on that truck costs more. And so for us, when we think about shipping, we're thinking about how can we put eight pallets on that refrigerated truck we have and, and move it to Kansas City or move it to Wichita or move it to, to Manhattan or, or wherever. It's, it's how, much can we, how much dollars can we put on that truck to really spread it out. Um, and so that's really how we go about it. I think there's a question in the back. Yeah, um, you were saying that you sometimes make the decision to go from organic to conventional because the demand for organic wasn't in the demand for the local. Um, but that means you're running a mixed uh, system. Mm -hmm. So how does that impact the OMS tracking mix system? Are you removing organic? 
So um, the question was basically, how do I deal with the transition between organic and conventional production, being a mixed use operation? And, and it's tricky. Um, we have a power washer at both. We have two farms, basically. We have the home farm, then we have a satellite farm on the other side of the river. That's another guy's farm that lets us just keep stuff there. So we have a power washer at both, and we have a record book at both. And you know, in the pack house, we have, um, you know, if we go from, from beets, you know, when we start out the day, we start out uh, washing and cleaning our organic stuff. And so we can run our beets and our, our tomatoes and organic zucchini stuff through the wash line. And then we'll bring in the organic uh, or the conventional uh, winter squash to run. And so usually we're trying to start with organic at the beginning of the day and end with the conventional because there's no real record keeping needed when you go from organic to conventional. But when you go back, it takes time and effort. And so I haven't tracked those expenses that well because um, a lot of that's on my own time. Because um, I'm doing quite a bit of the cultivating, the planting um, with our with our row crop planner and and all that on that larger scale stuff. But it is something like this year we started growing, uh, we did some new test plots of organic winter squash. And so this year we had twin line stuff. So we were doing organic winter squash and conventional winter squash. And so, you know, it was just making sure every single crate, you know, harvest bin that we had sitting in the shed had stickers and had verification on it. Because if it didn't, we had to treat it as conventional even if it was an organic crop. And so as it came out of the field, there was an organic sticker and an organic you know, traceability tag that got put on. Basically, we used green tags for organic, yellow tags for conventional, and you know, it's, it takes more time and training with the employees to make sure that uh, we keep that organic integrity for sure. Yeah, and so I'm a, she was asking what we use on the conventional side versus the organic. So on the organic, we're using Pyganic and we're, you know, doing all hand hoeing and, and, and cultivating with, uh, you know, field cultivators behind the tractor and all of that. But on the conventional side, we're putting down a pre-emergent herbicide to keep the broad leaves out. We use Escort and it's fantastic. Um, I mean, I've never had something that kept pigweeds out better than, uh, than hand hoeing. Um, the nice thing about the conventional is when we do put down a pre-emergent, that's really the only herbicide we use, and it cuts our labor hours significantly. Um, and on my computer, I actually just worked up a new enterprise budget for 20 acres of winter squash conventionally, and it's amazing our cost per pound there versus the cost per, per pound organic. Um, you know, I said I think the break-even um, for the conventional is like 27 cents. The break-even for organic is like 38 or something. Um, you know, and that adds up really quickly when you're trying to, to move volume. Um, but yeah, so we are using a, a conventional, you know, synthetic herbicide. We're putting down synthetic fertilizer at the beginning of the year. We're putting down foliar fertilizer on the plants. Um, it was a very, it was a drought year in Kansas, so we didn't have to use any fungicide. But if it's a really wet, bad year, um, usually we do use an organic fungicide just because it, works better, but I tend to not like fungicides. I'd rather have the soil be healthy enough to support that plant um, through crop rotation and you know stuff like that. But you know, we, we use the tools that are in the toolbox when we grow um, conventionally or organically. Yeah, we, we work with um, a group called Proactive Ag in Kansas to get most of our organic fertilizers and OMRI approved stuff. And, and they are bringing, they are really focusing a lot of their growth as a business on conventional farmers and bringing in more of those kind of non-traditional EPA registered, um, you know, uh, herbis or, you know, pesticides and fungicides. And, and it's really, um, it's a good thing. But what's nice for me is I started out as organic. It's so like the first two years I did conventional, I really struggled. Um, I didn't, you know, I didn't know what I was doing, um, which I think was a good thing because it really made me learn that I don't want to put down extra. You know, when I go uh, and I plant non-GMO corn or something conventionally, I'll go into the, uh, you know, my chemical applicator because I don't do any of that spraying. I'll go in and go to order my stuff and they'll give me the list of what they want to put down. And it's like, what is, that is a hell of a cocktail. And for us, we can, we can cut it down to just, you know, one or two um, and, and really have good management with, you know, dragging a six-row cultivator through the field.
Well, I think there were some more questions, and so uh, we can talk afterward. Does that work? This one over here. And Emily, what's your system for logging labor? How do you make sure it gets done? I just get in the rhythm of doing it, and I just do it. Yeah. Part of the reason I decided to to just track every crop at once was so I didn't have to remember to start keeping track of my time now and then not, not do it for other things. It seemed easier to me to just do it all the time. Um, but yeah, once you do it for a while, you can kind of, you can kind of just know how long it's going to take you to weed a bed and maybe you can quit tracking that and you just know and write it down, but you just have to decide, I think. <laughs> Uh, the first year, it was just me and my business partner. Um, now we hire somebody part-time. But, yeah, mostly just us. And then, I guess for my operation, this time of year, I have two full-time people. Uh, she asked how many people um, work for either of us. Or he, sorry. Um, but um, So I have two full-time people plus myself this time of year. But in season, we have, I don't know, roughly seven to ten. We... I mean, it's usually six because four of them don't ever show up or, you know, stuff like that. We, I think last year we went through about 27 people to keep enough people on staff. And, event, you know, every once in a while we'll have to hire temp agencies, and that's never fun. Um, labor's a real big struggle for us on our farm. And, you know, that's maybe one of the reasons why we've switched to, to some more conventional growing. It's because I can reduce our labor hours per acre tremendously um, with that pre-emergent herbicide. Any other questions? Yeah. I, um, what do you do for um, for your because you're blending these, your earthway you know lines? What do you do for weed control in your organic greens? So do you them a lot? Like, we really don't. We try and just we will till, and then you know an hour later we'll plant and we'll get that drip line on it, and you know we'll ninety percent of the time we'll beat the weeds. Um, and, you know, we do assume there's going to be some loss here and there. Um, this summer, with the drought, we lost some spinach beds because the pigweed just beat us. Um, and so, you know, we kind of budget to know that we're going to lose about a quarter acre every year to just crop loss. I mean, in my budget, you'll see that I, what, uh, I assume a 15% harvest loss, what we anticipate per acre is yield. And so maybe that's, you know, we're going through the field and we're going, oh, these leaves aren't that good and we're throwing leaves out as we harvest or, or in the pack house. But, you know, some of that can be just, we just abandon a bed. Um, or we have slow sales for a week because, you know, the students were out at KU for the week and, um, you know, we'll just have, uh, you know, a crop of greens blend, get too tall and, you know, our, our customers like the little stuff. Um, and so that's where on the lettuce it's difficult for us because you either get that perfect crop or you don't. Um, there's no number two. Um, I don't have a market for that oversized lettuce. There's not enough people around us that want like braising greens for, for cheap. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, that's a struggle with the lettuce is trying to, you know, and that takes us a lot of time to sit down and figure out um, when exactly to plant, how many bed feet to plant, things like that. Like we know graduation weekend of, of KU is a really big week for us. And so that's like the 14th of May, I think this year. And so we'll make sure we plant an extra 100 feet of everything that week because we'll be shipping a lot. But, um, you know, also we have to be cognizant of it's better to have a little bit more than not enough. You never want to tell a customer you can't deliver or you're out. Uh-huh. Emily, can you talk about um, how you set your thing up here? Mark a question, but how do you set your tomatoes up so I don't have to pick all mine up off the floor? How do you do yeah, um, the year the budget I showed you was for um, they were just in the field and we did the Florida weave. Um, do you know Do you know what that system is like? Um, Florida weave, Florida basket, weave. basket weave. Okay, there you go. You d you set up T posts uh, every I don't know. You can put them ten feet apart or four feet apart, whatever you want, um, and you just use twine and you, you like weave in and around the plants and wrap it around the post when you get to it and they just kind of get held up by, by the twine. Um, now we have a high tunnel where we grow them so they're, they're trellised on strings. Um, we prune each plant to have one or two liters depending on what it is and just clip them up as they grow. So yeah, the growing cherry tomatoes in the field is probably not an ideal way to do it because they split really easily, but that's how we did it for that budget, and we still came out good. So, 
I think there's more wiggle room than maybe maybe you'd think. Well, on our farm, I'll just say we're getting back into it, uh, growing slicer tomatoes and stuff. Um, we're putting in some mega high tunnels that it's going to allow us to do a whole bunch of stuff under plastic, and it'll be Florida basket weed. So if you just type it in on Google, I remember when I first learned that there's like an image that shows you how to do it, and it's very helpful. We do every four plants when we when we put in posts. Are you using a We got a sketchy pack the crew wears with twine, and then they walk through and, <coughs> and weave. Yeah. Anybody else? Have you integrated any livestock or dogs to you know, utilize some of your loss for you? Um, we got pigs this past year, and they're a, a great use for ugly vegetables that I don't want to eat myself. Makes me want to just grow a field of tomatoes just for the pigs. It's so fun. <laughs> so um, on our farm, I don't own any animals, even though I do all the hay. For us, the animal side's been something I would love to get into, but the food safety side of being a large grower yeah. keeps us from being able to put animals out. Um, so we, what we don't donate to the food bank that we don't sell uh, or ship to the produce auction, we will uh, compost and then we'll spread that compost back out in the field. And so um, I, ha I do have a neighbor that'll come by and pick up a couple crates of winter squash or something when we're sorting through that stuff to feed to his animals. But it's something I really wish we could do, but the new FISMA laws and GAP and all that, you know, we've kind of hit that threshold where food safety is, yeah, more important than the sustainability with, you know, multi-species diversity. Question over there? Um, yeah, if there's a, if we're thinking about selling a certain crop, say to the co-op in Decorah, um, we, we tell them this is the lowest price we can sell this for. And if you want that, that's great. And if you don't, we'll sell it at the farmer's market. So sometimes we do. For us, I try not to just show them this, but you know, I'm also happy to show them it sometimes. Cause sometimes if you show them one crop, like, like Whole Foods, to show them one of these, the first time we met and I was like, so this is how I go about thinking of it. I think it gave them a respect for, you know, when I come in with a price where I'm at, because they know I need to make a certain margin just like they need to make a certain margin when they put it on their shelf. I mean, they have the same budget, you know, for their produce department. Um, and so I think for them to know that, and I'm not just going in blind is a, a kind of a empowering thing for us and, and, a, and a respect thing for them. So yeah, thanks guys. <laughs>